I'm going to ask you to take your Bible and open to Psalm 139. Psalm 139. I'm going to go ahead and warn you. Today might be a little heavy. This is not a topic that most of us like to discuss, but one that I usually preach on each year because of its needfulness. Today we are going to talk about the sanctity of human life from womb to tomb. And given the recent political milieu that we find ourselves in with uh, recent uh, arguments before the Supreme Court on a court case that could have the potential to overturn um, Roe v. Wade uh, and other abortion um, rulings that have, in effect, legalized abortion throughout the United States. I think this is particularly apropos. Um, and so I want us to consider this. Now today, I'm going to read a couple excerpts from Russ Moore's, uh, a couple things that he's written several years ago, because I think he puts so well what today is about and what we really um, need to be focusing on. So he originally wrote this back uh, on the 40th anniversary of the Roe v. Wade case, which actually we would normally celebrate next week, uh, but I moved it up a week just in terms of the calendar. We are actually at the year 49 this year, 49 years since Roe v. Wade was decided. He says this, as we, appre- as we approach the anniversary of the infamous Roe v. Wade Supreme Court decision, churches in my tradition, he's talking about the SBC, will observe Sanctity of Human Life Sunday. I hate that we have to. Don't get me wrong, I think it's a joy to preach the whole counsel of God, and I love the truth of human dignity and the image of God in all persons, but it makes me sad. I don't hate human sanctity of human life Sunday because I think it's somehow unbiblical. No, indeed, the entire canon throbs with God's commitment to the fatherless and to the widows, his wrath and the shedding of innocent blood. I don't hate it because I think it's inappropriate. Just as every Lord's Day should be Easter with the proclamation of the resurrection of Jesus and Christmas with the announcement of the Incarnation, so every Lord's Day should highlight the worth and dignity of human life. I hate Sanctity of Human Life Sunday because I'm reminded that we have to say things to one another that human beings shouldn't have to say. Mothers shouldn't kill their children. Fathers shouldn't abandon their babies. No human life is worthless, regardless of skin color or age or disability or economic status. The very fact that these things must be proclaimed is a reminder of the horrors of this present darkness. I hate Sanctity of Human Life Sunday because I'm reminded that as I'm preaching, there are babies warmly nestled in wombs who won't be there tomorrow. I'm reminded that there are children, maybe even blocks from my pulpit, who will be slapped or punched or burned with cigarettes before nightfall. I'm reminded that there are elderly men and women languishing away in loneliness, their lives pronounced to be a waste. But I also love Sanctity of Human Life Sunday because I think about the fact that in our churches there are ex-orphans all around, adopted into loving families. I love to reflect on the men and women who serve every week in pregnancy centers for women in crisis, And I love to see men and women who have aborted babies find sins forgiven, even this sin, and their consciences cleansed by Christ. We'll always need Christmas, and we'll always need Easter, but I hope, please Lord, someday soon, that sanctity of human life Sunday is unnecessary. Don't you feel the weight of that? I do. I'm with him. I I hate preaching messages like this because it makes my heart heavy. But I love it as well because I think it allows us the chance to do two things. To be a moral witness in a dark age while proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ. You see, sometimes what happens to us when we talk about moral issues is we are content to either complain or condemn but never to comfort with the gospel. So today I want to do all of those things. I want to be clear that abortion is murder. No ifs, ands, or buts around it. To kill a baby in the womb is murder. But 
Even as God forgave Paul of murder and David of murder and countless other people throughout the centuries of murder, he can forgive any of us as well. Lest I remind you, friend, that murder does not begin in an abortion clinic, but in here. Do you remember what Jesus said in John chapter 5? That one who looks at his neighbor, his brother, with hatred in his heart has already committed murder. Do you believe this? Because if you do, we're all murderers. Whether we followed it with our hands or just our hearts. And praise be to God that His grace is strong enough and big enough and deep enough that no matter what sin we have committed, there is no one, no one beyond the hand of God to save. Now, the sanctity of human life is an issue larger than abortion, without doubt. And in the past, I have talked about other issues that impact or related to this. But given, as I said, the context of our day and age and the imminence, I hope, of the reversal of a terrible court decision, I felt appropriate to focus more on the idea of abortion. So I want to talk to you a little bit about how bad this really is. Because I think sometimes it's easier for us to assume that somehow that's an issue out there. That it's not in here. And it's not with us. It's not in our community. It's not in our church. And so I want to kind of bring that down to this. I'm going to begin with globally and nationally, and then we'll narrow it down. So here are some, some stats on abortion. Since 1973, more than 60 million babies have been murdered worldwide. More than a million of those are performed in the U.S. alone. Can you fathom that? That a million people, people, persons, real people, have been murdered in the very place where they should be the safest The Guttmeyer Institute also estimates that from 2010 to 2014, an estimated 56 million induced abortions had occurred each year worldwide. The U.S., along with North Korea, Canada, and China, are the only four countries that allow abortion on demand at any time during all nine months of pregnancy. In 2014, nearly two in ten pregnancies in the U.S. ended in abortion. Abortion rates from that same year indicate that one in four women will have an abortion by the age of 45 and one in five by the age of 30. What that means, friend, is that you may be sitting next to someone right now who's had an abortion or work with someone who has or sits across the table from you at your home. Nine out of ten abortions are performed in the first 13 weeks of pregnancy. As the birth rate continues to slowly decline in our country, nearly half of pregnancies are reported as unplanned. Most women who choose abortion in their 20s have already had at least one child. Per capita, African American women are nearly three times more likely to experience abortion than white women. The average woman choosing abortion makes the decision within a day of confirming her pregnancy and obtains abortion within the next week. The most frequent reason for abortion is financial. In fact, 92% of all abortions performed are elective, meaning that they are not the result of um, physical danger to the mother or anything like that, or for the issues of rape or incest or contrary to what we probably often hear on the television. Currently, 43% of American adults believe abortion is morally acceptable. Now let's narrow it down a little bit. 7 out of 10 women who 
who choose abortion indicate that their religious preference is Christian. And more than a third of those women attend a Christian church more than once a month, or once a month or more at the time of their abortion. Four out of ten of those women state that they attend at least two times per month. More than half of churchgoers who have had an abortion report that no one in the church knows. It should not be this way. Two-thirds of these women feel church members would judge single women who are pregnant. Think about that. How would we have viewed Mary, the mother of Jesus? More than half feel that churches do not have a ministry prepared to discuss options during an unplanned pregnancy. And almost half feel that pastors' teachings on forgiveness don't seem to apply to terminated pregnancies. That's not true. The gospel is for all and everyone, no matter what you've done. Now listen to what happens after abortion. A study in 2017 evaluated nearly 1,000 women who had sought after-abortion support. The study found that 67.5% of the women surveyed visited a mental health professional after their first abortion compared to just 13% who had visited before their abortion. Similarly, 51% of women had used prescription drugs for psychological health after their first abortion, while only 6.6% had used similar prescriptions before their abortion. I don't know if there's always causation there, but there certainly seems to be correlation. Sin has consequences. It hurts. The male counterparts of these women experience similar struggles. Some push their partner to abort, thinking it's the most practical decision at the time. Others went along with whatever she wanted, believing this would be the supportive thing to do. Some beg their significant other to not abort, even promising to take responsibility for the child. Still, others never had an opportunity to express their feelings or desires, and they were told of the abortion weeks, months, or even years later. Men have opened up about the secrecy surrounding lost fatherhood, their sense of aloneness with the grief that is often not acknowledged by our culture. In Fatherhood Aborted, former CareNet president Guy Condon wrote, Abortion can have a negative effect on every part of a man's life, his emotions, his souls, his relationship, his work and his career, most definitely his relationship with God. So contrary to what our culture will tell us, abortion is not a woman's issue. Because it takes more than a woman to make a baby. You understand that, right? On more than one level, I hope. I don't think this is an issue just about life. It's actually a constellation of issues that relate to our understanding and teaching on sex, on marriage, on the meaning of life, and certainly the lordship of Jesus in all of those areas. In 2014, 86% of women who had an abortion were unmarried. You know what that tells me? There are a bunch of men who don't act like men. Because they're not understanding that what makes a family is a man who loves a woman enough, like Jesus loves her, to marry her and build a family. You see, that's a problem of cowardice. We're not teaching our boys what it means to be a man. Nearly four in ten women say that the baby's father was the most influential person in their abortion decision. Which also means that the men who do know and stick around a little bit are still cowards. Because they're unwilling to accept responsibility.
Now, there are some encouragements and some discouragements in this in terms of generations that are coming up. Among Generation Z, 29% believe that abortion is wrong, which unfortunately is a decrease from 33% of millennials. But in 2017, 39.5% of high school students had engaged in sexual intercourse, down from 41.2% in 2015, which is not, doesn't sound like a lot, but that's still thousands and thousands of kids. 21% of Generation Z believe that sex before marriage is morally wrong, which is an increase from 19% of millennials. You see, it's not about just murder. It's about self-control. It's about understanding what sex is for and in what context it applies. But preachers don't talk about that. We're too scared sometimes to say what the Bible has to say about intimacy within marriage and what it's for. I'm not talking about being crass or crude. I'm talking about saying things that the Bible says. That the marriage bed is to be undefiled and that that's where sex takes place. Do you understand? Love is not hooking up. Love is sacrifice and responsibility and the willingness to take responsibility for not just a woman, but a family. For what did God command from the beginning? In the image he made them, male and female, in his very likeness, and gave them a command, a command to fill the earth. You see, this is what God intends for us not to engage in pleasure, but in procreation, so that more and more people might know God and glorify Him with their lives. Now I want to read a little bit more from a separate article, but still equally helpful, I think, in regards to this. Most Christians recognize, and rightly so, the loss of millions of unborn human lives. We are... What we often forget is the second casualty of the abortion culture, which is the consciences of countless men and women. Too often, pastors and church leaders assume that when talking about abortion, our invisible debating partner is the pro-choice television commentator or politician. But this is usually not so. Many of the people endangered by the abortion culture aren't even truly pro-choice. In our congregations on Sundays and in the neighborhoods around our churches, there are women vulnerable to the abortionist propaganda, not because they reject the church, but because they feel afraid they'll lose the church. Pregnant young women are scared they'll scandalize church people when they start to show, so they keep it secret. Parents are fearful their pregnant daughter or their son's pregnant girlfriend will prompt the rest of the congregation to see them as bad families. As they keep all this secret from the body of Christ, many of them fall prey to the false gospel of the abortion clinic, which says, we can take care of this for you, and it will all go away. Moreover, there are thousands of men and women in our churches who have aborted their children or urged the abortion of their grandchildren. Bearing the shame of this, they keep it secret. And in the concealment, the satanic powers accuse them, we know who you are. You're a murderer like us. Every time pastors and church leaders speak, they are speaking at least potentially to these men and women and aborting the aborting and the abortionist. Many of these people don't urge, don't argue that the fetus is a person. Their consciousness already testified to that. And they either are tortured by this or are violently trying to sear over that persistent internal message. The answer for the church is to preach the gospel to the conscience. To speak directly to people, to the woman who has had the abortion, to the man who paid for it, to the health care worker who has profited off of tearing off apart the bodies of young and the consciences of their parents. Speaking clearly of the horror of the judgment to come is necessary. We must confirm that every accusing conscience already knows clinic privacy laws cannot keep all this from being exposed to the tribunal of Christ. When the light shines, there's not enough darkness in which to, to hide and to cringe. But we can't stop there. We must proclaim just as openly that judgment has fallen on the quivering body of Jesus Christ who was crucified, accused by Satan, indicted by the law, enveloped by the curse. 
An abortion clinic culture already knows that hell exists, and they know that judgment awaits. And we must agree with this, but point, to them, point them to the truth that God is not simply willing to forgive them. He's willing to make them new. To show them how in Christ God is both just and the justifier of the one who has faith. The woman who has, the, has had the abortion needs to know that if she is hidden in Christ, God does not see her as that woman who had an abortion. He hasn't been subverted from sending her to hell because she found a gospel loophole. In Christ, she's already experienced hell and made it through to life. And in the resurrected Christ, God has already told her what he thinks of her. You are my beloved child, and in you I am well pleased. The conscious is around us. Don't believe that they're what they're telling themselves. They're scared and accused. Shine the light in the eyes of their consciences. Prophetically, all for justice, legally and culturally, for the unborn. We can't stop there. After all, the spirit of murder, as I said, doesn't start or end in the abortion clinic. And the blood of Christ has cleaned the consciences, consciences of rebels like all of us. We must warn of hell, but always offer mercy. The mercy that Jesus Christ died to give. Now, as a way forward, what I want to do is I want to look at Psalm 139. I know this is a passage that most of you have probably heard in the context of the saint of human life or in other places. I just want us to walk for just a minute through this passage so we can see that God considers life to be precious, and He wants us to consider life to be precious as well. So in Psalm 139, what we find is this relationship between the glory of God and the sanctity of human life, showing us that God knows us, He created us, and eventually He will judge us, which brings us to the need for all of us to be saved by the power of Christ, crucified and resurrected. If God is the author of life, then it changes how we must understand issues related to human life, what it means, what it's for, what we do with it, and what God intends for us to do with it. So let's look here in Psalm 139. We're going to go through the first 12 verses, and then I'll tell you a few things, and we'll go to the next section, and I'll tell you a few things, and so on and so forth. So this is a Psalm of David, it says, for the choir director. O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You understand my thought from afar. You scrutinize my path and my lying down and are intimately acquainted with all my ways. Even before there is a word on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it all. You have enclosed me behind and before and laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is too high. I cannot attain to it. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, behold, you are there. If I take the wings of the dawn, if I dwell in the remotest part of the sea, even there your hand will lead me, and your right hand will lay hold of me. If I say, surely the darkness will overwhelm me, and the light around me will be night, even the darkness is not dark to you, and the night is as bright as the day. Darkness and light are alike to you. So I want you to see here, the first thing is the comprehensive knowledge and presence uh, of God is amazing, right? God's knowledge of us and where we are, what we're doing, what we're going to do, we're going to see, is not hidden from God. He knows all things. We usually call this the omniscience of God, his ability to know all things that can be known. And so this is a, an idea that shows up all over Scripture, right? That God knows everything there is to know, and most particularly, He knows everything there is to know about you and I. So much so, that this ought to bring both fear and trembling to us, but also comfort and delight. So think on this for a second, friend. No matter what you've done, good, bad, or indifferent, God already knows it. Imagine if your parents had all that knowledge. You'd be a little scared, wouldn't you? Oh, no. They know what I did. In fact, I remember um, as a kid, you know, often what you do is, you know, you beat up your brother, and then you're like, oh, no, they have a bruise. You're like, I wonder if my parents will notice that he has a bruise. Because you know if they know, then you're going to get your butt beat. 
because you beat up your brother. Now, my brother's bigger than I am now, so I probably couldn't beat him up. But back in the day, I could. What if they find out? What if they know? I'm going to get in trouble. Friend, God already knows. You realize that, right? Like, there's nothing hidden from his eye. The good thing you did that you want everybody to know about, and also the bad thing you did yesterday, he knows about it. And that ought to scare us. Because that means that we can't hide our sins in ignorance. Whether that sin is the sin of abortion or the sin of judgmentalism. You see. But what this also means is that if God knows everything and he still says he loves you, that means he's not going to stop loving you because of some junk that you did. You see, God does not love you and I because of us. That's what the world tells us. They essentially say, you're loved because everyone is lovable. This is not what the Bible tells us. It tells us everyone is loved because God is good and He is love. Not because you and I deserve it. It is unconditioned. As in, you can't do anything to earn God's love. And frankly, you can't do anything to lose it. And so this brings us both fear and trembling, but also comfort and hope because God, in His knowledge of us, still wants a relationship with us. And David is amazed by this. It blows his mind. Oh Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up? You know every thought from afar. I don't even have to tell you. You examine my path, my lying down. You're intimately acquainted with all my ways. So the knowledge here of God is not just a mere factual knowledge. God knows it because he knows us. God knows it even before we know it, even before there is a word on my tongue. Behold, O Lord, you know it all. Not only do you know all things, you are everywhere. Where can I go, Lord, that you will not be there? Where can I flee from your presence? In heaven, not there. In hell, not there. On the wings of the dawn, in the remotest part of the sea, not there. Even there, your hand will lead me. And your white hand will lay hold of me. In other words, this this is like uh, Hebrews chapter 4. right? There is no one who can avoid the eyes of God. They go throughout all the earth. Everywhere God sees So God's unsearchable knowledge of us is amazing. We don't even possess that sort of knowledge for ourselves. We discover things about ourselves sometimes, usually about how bad we are, and we didn't think we were that bad. Remember I told you about how when sometimes you're arguing with your wife or your spouse, and you say something, and you're like, oh, I didn't mean to say that. And I told you what you really should say is, I'm sorry I said what I meant. That was in there, down deep, somewhere, and you let it out, and you are embarrassed and surprised that it was in there. God already knows that, knows things about us that we don't even know for ourselves, but his presence is also with us everywhere. We call this uh, omnipresence, right? God is there everywhere. Why does this matter? Because life has purpose because God knows us. Right? We don't live in this deistic uh, world that God just kind of made and then stepped back and then everything just kind of works like a clock. God is intimately involved in everything that happens. Sometimes our, His hand is unseen. We don't know what He's doing. We don't know how He's working. We can't perceive His activity. But He's still there, both in His knowledge of what we're doing and in His presence with us everywhere. So life has purpose because God knows us and He's with us. In other words, the reason that life has 
significance, that it has dignity and worth. It's not because of us, but because of God. Because He's here, because He made it. He made us in His likeness for His purposes that we might know and glorify Him. And so to rob someone of life is to rob God of what He deserves. So not only is murder an affront to the person, but to the God who made that person. You see... So when we talk about sanctity of human life, we're not merely talking about murder. We're talking about robbing God of that which He made, of that which He is owed. It is not merely an affront to a person, but to the person. So what must we do? Well, first we take comfort in God's knowledge of us by resting in His providence. So there's nothing that we encounter that God has not already filtered through His love for us. Think on that. Sometimes what He loves, that He loves us, He allows us to experience great difficulty. But what if the things of life were not filtered through God's love and providence for us? It was truly blind chance. That sounds a lot worse than the hand of God directing the lives of men and women. We also take courage in God's knowledge, knowing that we can defend the sanctity of life because God has made it. He is on the side of life. You know, we often hear about being on the wrong side of history. Well, if you oppose this and you oppose that, you're on the wrong side of history, friend. No. God is the author of history. He is the one who will win. So to be on His side, no matter how unpopular, is to be on the right side. You see, something that our world often confuses is that somehow consensus equals truth. This is not so. If the whole world was wrong and God was right, it would not matter. It wouldn't change what was true or false. In fact, Paul says this in Romans chapter 3. Let the whole world be a liar and God be proved right. You see, truth is not determined in the court of public opinion. Now, popularity might. Persecution might. But truth is not. It doesn't change. Because it's founded on who God is, what He knows, and what He does. Not only are we known by God, let's look at the next set of verses, we are created by God. Verse 13, For you formed my inward parts. You wove me together in my mother's womb. Think about the intricacy that is indicated here. God is actively involved in putting you together. Just as he was actively involved in putting Adam and Eve together. Remember, he took the dust of the ground and made it into a man, and then took the rib from the man and made it into a woman. This same activity is the same activity by some mystery in the, in the working of God that happens to each one of us through natural processes, but God is using and, and, and superintending those things in some significant way so that David can speak of it as if God has knit him together as a garment. I will give thanks to you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Why? Because everything that God makes is wonderful. Because He's wonderful. Wonderful are your works, and my soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret, and skillfully wrought in the depths of the earth. Your eyes have seen my unformed substance. In your book were, and in your book were all written the days that are or ordained for me, when as yet none of them has begun. So this is the nature of it. God made us. You know, these days, um, we actually are able to see into the womb in pretty significant ways. My wife does ultrasound, and she can use a very complex machine to shoot sound waves into the womb of a mother and, dest- and determine bodily features. By eight weeks, you can see a heartbeat. I mean, it looks like a little bean. It's a real person with a real heart. You can begin to see fingers and toes. You can determine the gender of a child. Even now, they have 3D ultrasounds where it can depict 
a, a three-dimensional picture of this child. In fact, uh, my brother and his wife are having another child, and they recently did a, a 3D ultrasound. And you can tell that that child looks like their daughter who's already been born. It's wild. Same forehead and everything. What was secret for David is in some ways on display for us. We get to see what God is doing in the womb. In fact, this is one of the reasons why Southern Baptists have begun an initiative called the Psalm 139 Initiative, where they place ultrasound machines in pregnancy centers around specifically the United States. They've placed 30 ultrasounds because one of the number one ways to convince a person that there is really another person inside of them is to show it to them. Because when you see that picture... The truth is evident. You see, this is why most people don't advocate for infanticide. Because once they see that baby, they're like, oh no, it's a real person. And once they see that baby in the womb, knitted together by God's own hand, you realize that's really a person. So God made us. He creates us in the womb, forms and shapes us. Not just our form, but also our future. You see, God creates our form even when no one else can see it. Can see it. John MacArthur says this, No human being is ever conceived outside of God's will or ever conceived apart from God's image. Life is a gift from God created in His own image. And so what God sees is us from the very beginning. And as Zach prayed, has a plan for us. He knows every single day before it's even happened. God creates our future. No one else knows the future, but he knows the future. Now, we might sometimes hear the objection here. Well, well, science doesn't really know when life begins. Let me read to you a couple quotes from uh, medical doctors. Okay, So just so you know that this is bogus claim. Dr. Micheline Matthews Roth, who is at Harvard Medical School, says this, It is incorrect to say that biological data cannot be decisive. It is scientifically correct to say that an individual human life begins at conception. Or Dr. Jerome Lejeune, uh, who is often called the father of modern genetics, says, To accept the fact that after fertilization has taken place, a new human has come into being is no longer a matter of taste or opinion. It is plain experimental evidence. Each individual has a very neat beginning at conception. Or Dr. Alfred, if I'm going to murder this one, it's hard. Bon Giovanni professor of pediatrics and obstetrics at the University of Pennsylvania. I am no more prepared to say than that these early stages represent an incomplete human being than I would to say that a child prior to the dramatic effects of puberty is not a human being. I have learned from my earliest medical education that human life begins at the time of conception. Which is why now, most times in the debate, the question becomes, well, is that human being a person? And, of course, the biblical data tells us that it is. This is why I mentioned to you on Wednesday, if you were here, that we see that the biblical words for a baby is applied to not just child, children outside the womb, but children inside the womb. And the first person who recognizes Jesus as the Messiah is a baby in the womb. Why? Because he's a person. In fact, if they're not then the whole prospect of the incarnation is pointless. If Jesus doesn't become a person until later, then he could have just avoided the whole, you know, being in the baby in the womb thing. But he doesn't. He is born and conceived as a child, as a person from the very beginning. So if God shapes us in our form in the womb, then he has authority over our life. This is why I said this is an issue of lordship as well. What we do with our life and what we do with other people's lives is not ultimately up to you and I. God is the author of life. And for us who have known him in faith, he is doubly our Lord. Not only is he our Lord by creation, he is our Lord by redemption. So you and I don't have the right to say, God, I don't want to do what you want me to do. 
So when he tells us that sex is reserved for marriage, we don't get to buck that authority and say, I don't really want to do that, because there will be consequences. When we say, I don't really want to do this, I don't really want to do that, I'd rather do this, God. What we're doing is looking at God and saying, I don't care. I don't care that you're the Lord of the universe, that you're the author of life, that you're the Lord of my life. I don't care. Most of us would not do that with our parents or a boss or a police officer. We don't do that with other kinds of authority. Why would we do that with the ultimate authority? So God shapes our form. He shapes our future. And so he has authority over our life. Which means that we must learn to both protect life in the womb and at all stages from there on out. You see, the attack on life is not just abortion. Often it's at the end of life. Because the same logic that often is applied to an unborn baby, they're dependent, you know, whatever, becomes applied to elderly people at the end of their life. They don't have any function or any value to society. And this is not so. From the moment of our conception to the moment when God demands our life and death, we are valuable full of dignity and worth, because God said so. No one is dispensable. We better make sure we understand, because one day God will judge. Look at verse 17. How precious are your thoughts to me, O God! How vast is the sum of them! If I should count them, they would outnumber the sand. When I wake, I am still with you. Oh, that you would slay the wicked, O God! Depart from me, therefore, men of bloodshed! For they speak against you wickedly, and your enemies take your name in vain. Do I not hate those who hate you, O Lord, and do not loathe those who rise up against you? I hate them with an utmost hatred. They have become my enemies. What what is David saying? He's trying to ask God for justice in a world filled with injustice. But notice what he also does. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any hurtful way in me. And lead me in the everlasting way. You see, David knows that he is just as much responsible to God as all the wicked people. Because we are all wicked. We are all sinners destined for wrath. And what we need, everyone, whether a big sinner or a little one, whether we've aborted our child or just told one little white lie, we are all in need of a Savior. So no one gets a pass because they're good, because there's no one who's good. We must all find that God loves us and knows us, and He will judge us. So we must understand. We must understand that the gospel is God's way. Of making us right with Him. So it's right for us and good for us to hold others accountable for injustice. And it's right and good for God to hold us accountable for injustice. And to remember that only those who look to Christ will be forgiven for their injustice. So we must expose those things that are contrary to the gospel. Abortion is contrary to the gospel. The answer for it is the gospel. We must understand that what we offer to people, always and everywhere, is the good news of great joy. That Jesus came into this world to live a sinless life, to die our place on a cross, that we might find in Him forgiveness. And that He rose from the dead, not only to give us forgiveness, but new life. A life, as David says, in the everlasting way. So what can we do? Let me give you a few things here as we wrap up. The first is this. We must not let our support for the sanctity of human life be merely a complaint or a criticism of our nation or our world. Or simply think that because once or twice a year we talk about it and preach about it, that that's all that's needed. We must be clear to call out injustice and sin, but also be equally as bold and clear to promise the comfort of the gospel. Those things must always go together. 
And in our world, I'm afraid that too often, whether you're on the right or the left or this issue or that issue, we are more apt to complain and to criticize than we are to actually provide an answer. You see, the church has the answer. It always has. I'm not saying we shouldn't make good laws or anything like that, but the answer for the ills of society is not more money, more time, more laws, more this, more that. It's Jesus. Like, just that. This is why Paul never directly condemns slavery, because he knows that the answer to slavery is not a new Roman law, but a new people redeemed by the grace of Jesus Christ that will treat other people the way Christ has treated them. That's hard to do. Easy to understand, hard to do, because it takes us understanding the depth of what Christ has done for us and being willing to give that same grace to someone that we probably don't like. I mentioned to you a couple weeks ago about the ladies that were in the viral video taking the abortive chemical abortive pills. And they were chanting, abortion, abortion, abortion. And we look at that and we think, how horrible. But if that's all that we think, we don't think, how can I pray for them to know Jesus? Then we've only done the first part of the equation and not the second. You see, if I don't want those women or the terrorists who fly planes in the buildings or the person who murders the little girl down the street, or the drunk driver who killed my son, if I don't want those people to know Jesus, then I don't understand grace. Because I'm no better than any of those people. I may look better on the outside. For all the world, I may be a good, moral person. But I'm wicked. The same as them. I put Jesus on a tree. For my sin. And if Jesus can't save those people, then he can't save me. So we have to be consistent in our faithful and consistent and faithful in our gospel witness. We must really work towards bringing the gospel to bear, not just a criticism. We also must consider practical ways like adoption or foster care or helping those who are in those processes. One of the great things is, this is an unwanted baby. I don't think I can raise it. Well, give it to someone who will. There are thousands and thousands and thousands of families waiting in the wings to adopt children who are unwanted by their biological family but certainly wanted by God and His family. We need to be regular givers of our money to churches, to crisis pregnancy centers. I told you about the, act, I mean, the Psalm 139 project. You can give directly to that, to put a, an ultrasound machine, which is a several thousand, hundred thousand dollar machine in a clinic to help a woman and a man see that their little baby really is a little baby. We should volunteer, whether it's at the Crisis Pregnancy Center or maybe it's, it's finding some way to support that. We need to be giving our time and effort to these things. We should be involved in spreading truth and good literature. In fact, next week we're going to give you a pamphlet that is designed to help you understand the arguments of pro-life and abortion or pro-choice and how we can work through those things with people who parrot often the things they hear on TV and the Internet. They don't really believe They're just going along with what culture says. We need to learn to minister to the abortionists and the abortion clinics in town. Not by going out there and picketing and stuff like that, but like befriending them. You know, like Jesus did. He was a friend of sinners. I'm not saying they're going to be your best friend. But most of the time we don't win people by yelling at them. I know that never helps me arguing with my wife. She just yells back because I deserve it. But if I approach her with kindness and gentleness and understanding, even if I'm right, that always goes better. 
This is why Jesus does. He eats with sinners and tax collectors. Because those are the people that need salvation. Not the self-righteous who think they already have it. Perhaps we need to dream a new kind of ministry. Some new way to impact our community and those in it. We need to support and vote for leaders who are committed to protecting life. Now, I'm not into telling you who you should or shouldn't vote for, but if a person affirms the right to murder another person, probably not the right person. But what this requires is research, awareness, an understanding of the issues, and a willingness to engage in the process that God, by His grace, has allowed us to be a part of. Most people in human history have not been a part of that process. May we be found faithful. We need to be involved in pertinent legislation. And of course, what we need to do always is pray. Pray, pray, pray. For the only one who can ultimately change a human heart, a society, is God. Now God, when we pray, will often say, go and do. But we have to pray. So in that vein, I'm going to ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes. I'm going to read a prayer that actually originally came from an adaptation from Trevin Wax, just as a way for us to put this together. He says, O God of beginnings, you are the creator of all life. May you and your Holy Spirit, and by your voice of your church, lead your people to rescue innocent children from death and bring those who participate in their death to true repentance that they may taste of your goodness and mercy. Overcome evil with good in the hearts of those who reject your truth. Rebuke the enemy for the sake of innocent children and for your sake, O Lord. O great King of kings, let your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven for the sanctity of all human life. You have said that your kingdom is justice, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Where there is unrighteousness, let righteousness come to bear. Where there is hostility, cause your peace to reign supreme. Where there is sorrow, bring joy in the hearts of people. Lord Jesus Christ, as you hung on the hard wooden cross, you asked that those who are putting you to death might be forgiven. Please, Lord, help us to offer that same forgiveness to those who participate in abortion or euthanasia, the destruction of embryonic life, and who by other means violate the sanctity of human life, that in all things the world would know the height and the depth and the breadth and the width of your love and your mercy and your grace. Hear our prayers as we cry out to you to end the merciless shedding of innocent blood in our nation and throughout our world. Through death you have conquered death. And through your life we experience eternal and everlasting life. Cause life to spring forth in the hearts of all people. And bring forth a love and respect for life that will dominate our culture. May your kingdom and your church apprehend and overtake the culture of death that has prevailed through deceit and selfishness. May the seed of the woman crush the head of the serpent through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.